ahead and get started. Thanks for coming, everybody. This talk is uh, Redis Networking Nerd Down for lovers of packets and jumbo frames. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about TCP IP today. Um, our agenda, we'll give you an intro, uh, introduce myself and uh, my coworker Benji. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Distill, just to give some frame of reference in terms of what we do and um, uh, how the product works. And then I'm going to tell you a story, a customer story, a, a sort of peculiar use case that we ran into um, uh, and some of the tuning that it took us, uh, some of the tuning required to get around that, uh, specifically focus on packets per second. So we approach it from two angles, from the right side and the replication side. Um, and then we'll wrap up and uh, tell you some closing thoughts. So I'm John Bullard, and VP of Engineering here at Distill Networks. I work on core development and infrastructure. And this is Benji Taylor. Uh, he's our lead DevOps engineer. And together, we work through uh, most of what you're going to see today. So the short background about Distill, uh, what we do is we block bots. So we're reverse inline proxy. We're deployed in front of your web server. Every request that comes in is inspected. If it's a human, we transparently proxy it through to your origin server. If it looks like it's coming from an automated browser, automated request, botnet, anything suspicious, we can either flag it as malicious and you can take action on it at your origin, or we can go ahead and block it directly at edge so it doesn't concern, uh, consume any of your server resources. So customers purchase the product for a number of different use cases. Web scraping is a huge one. Uh, security protection, login vulnerabilities, these types of things, form spam. Um, analytics get thrown off by bots, so driving that down is pretty important, um, and a whole host of different use cases. So the blatant credibility grab, we work with very small customers uh, that use our CDN. We scale all the way up. We work with some very large customers, too, um, and everything in between. So um, we see a myriad of different use cases and different performance perspectives. So the product is architected. Um, we use Nginx as our web server because it's extremely fast and fairly easy to extend. Uh, requests come into Nginx. We have a number of custom modules that we've built out. We also have a number of services running on the device as well that do things like uh, request enrichment, client identification, uh, we'll do anomaly detection, consume some of the inline behavioral models um, that are happening at edge, as well as consuming data from our backend uh, cluster as well. So we use Redis uh, to maintain state for these client sessions um, and maintain some of the other state required to run the service. Uh, so this is all running on a single appliance. So the first uh, uh, deployment topology that we support is just a single master deploy. So if you're talking on-prem or in the cloud in your environment, uh, our appliance is deployed behind your load balancer. Um, so if there's any sort of failure with distill, we just drop from the pool and request flow to the, the back end. Um, this is pretty common, very easy to set up. Second model, which is uh, pretty popular, is our HA master master deploy. So what this is is two nodes running independently, and we set up a right duplication between them. So usually customers will balance uh, round robin between the two, and then the state between the, uh, both Redis masters is just duplicated. And then finally, for our, our, our some of the very high-end large cl uh, customers, uh, we support a master-slave cluster. Uh, so in this case, Oftentimes, we'll set a dedicated master that won't serve HTTP traffic, and then we fan out a number of uh, slaves, each with their own read slave that's syncing off the master, all of which uh, handle HTTP traffic on their own. This is the topology that we're going to be talking about today, um, because this is what the use case called for. So the customer story. Um, this happened, or this occurred probably late 2015. We're working with a customer here in San Francisco. They're a very large online marketplace. Uh, they have very, very high traffic volumes, and uh, their volume or their traffic pattern is very seasonal. So in the summertime, they hit uh, their seasonal peak, which comes in about 3x their historical peak. Um, so we were we were starting to gear up for that. 
Um, it was an EC2 deployment, all of it in EC2 Classic. They'd been deployed in EC2 Classic for a period of time, uh, didn't have any intention of migrating away from that, which introduced a couple of interesting challenges. So we, we approached this um, as we do with most deployments. Uh, we started a scaling exercise. We obviously chose the master-slave topology because we thought that would be the easiest to scale out. Uh, we went with nine nodes, so single master and then eight read slaves uh, to handle replication as well as to handle serving traffic and the inspection. We chose a C3 8XLs, which are pretty beefy machines. They're CPU optimized because uh, CPUs uh, or we're, we're fairly CPU bound when we're doing inspections. Uh, so we're talking 32 uh, virtual CPU cores, 60 gigs of RAM, and enhanced networking. So quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of horsepower. Um, what we did with the customer was we decided to start with a proof of concept. So we would onboard a small percentage of their traffic and take measurements and try and extrapolate out what full traffic load would look like at the time, as well as extrapolate up to the 3x seasonal peak and figure out uh, if this topology would, would handle full load. So these are, these are actually some of the measurements that we took. Um, it's a little small, but we're, we have processor load uh, going clockwise, available memory, uh, incoming packets on ETH0, and then incoming network traffic, so throughput. Um, looking at the slaves, uh, most of the performance was right where we expected it to be with plenty of overhead. So CPU was looking fine, no, no detectable uh, memory pressure. PPS, the packets per second, was fine as well, and total throughput on that, that pretty large NIC was perfectly okay. So nothing concerning here. Then we switched over to take a look at that dedicated master. Um, again, CPU, a little bit higher, but still acceptable. Uh, no memory pressure here either, which makes sense. Uh, I'm gonna skip PPS, I'll come back to that. And then if you take a look at throughput, again, 30 megs, scale that up in a 10 gig NIC, not a problem at all. PPS, though, did draw our attention. Um, the difference between this node and the, uh, the, the read slave was pretty significant. So if you take a look here, you're seeing baseline average uh, coming up to about 10,000 PPS with spikes upwards of 35,000, uh, depending on you know, certain, the, the traffic was somewhat bursty. There were also some background processes running which uh, pulled in large amounts of information. Um, so this, this caught our attention. It was a little bit concerning. Um, there's a semi-documented soft limit in EC2 Classic uh, that some of the virtual networking uh, begins, to, uh, begins to drop packets when you get above 100,000 packets per second uh, sustained. This isn't a problem in EC2, uh, the newer edition in VPC, but um, in EC2 Classic, it is a concern. Uh, it's been demonstrated. Uh, you, you can measure this yourself, and um, it's something the customer was concerned about as well for obvious reasons. So just real quickly, so we're all on the same page, PPS isn't something a lot of people think about day to day. So what is PPS? It's packets per second. So the packet, um, you know, strictly speaking, protocol data unit, uniform uh, format, uniform unit of instrumented data. So that includes header information, the control information for your specific protocol. It also includes the data payload that you're using. And strictly speaking, packets only refer to layer three when you're talking about network uh, protocols such as IP. Uh, when you're talking about layer two data link, uh, you're talking more about frames. And then when you're talking about transport layer uh, PDUs, you're talking about segments or uh, datagrams depending. So we're gonna, we're gonna generally talk about PPS, but strictly speaking, this is how the terminology changes. So back to our customer. Uh, what we did was we took measurements um, both in the customer environment and then our lab, and we, we took those at various levels and came up with a model to understand how PPS would scale up based on typical traffic loads on our appliance. So this is what it looked like with the, the current deployment. So uh, we had nine nodes deployed, but we, we wanted to look what would happen when we scaled up double that or more. Um, you can see master PPS coming around 9,000 um, in the slave, what we call edges. Uh, not a problem at all, close to 1,000. However, when we scale this up to full traffic volume, um, 
projected full traffic volume. At nine nodes, the master then is at 180,000 sustained PPS, which is well above that limit. This is definitely in the territory of seeing consistent packet loss um, in EC2 Classic, so this is gonna be a problem. Slaves, again, not, not as much of a concern, sustained around 20,000, which shouldn't be an issue at all. So, this was our challenge. The requirements, keeping master PPS under 100,000. Uh, the customer was not particularly opening to any, any sort of clustering. They didn't want to set up uh, anything in front of our environment to handle uh, sharding of the environment. They also didn't want to make any environmental changes, so moving out of EC2 Classic wasn't an option. Also, increasing costs uh, beyond the nine nodes that we had deployed wasn't an option either. So we, we had pretty strict bounds in terms of what we could do uh, with, with the cluster. So what we decided to do was figure out how we could tune for this very specific parameter. Let's turn it over to Benji to talk about the right side a little bit. Cool. So when uh, we first started looking at this, like John said, we approached it from the rights and replication standpoint. I kind of did the initial rights and what we could really do there. Um, and then John did the replication. So before we actually move into tuning, uh, I told the guys last night at the party, a few of them, that I would tell a joke up here today if they came to my talk. So um, we're gonna tell specifically a TCP, TCP IP joke for you. I um, started thinking last night, like, what could I really do? And I started thinking, like, how about an NTP joke? And I was like, I don't know, those really require timing. Um, so then I moved on, I'm like, maybe I'll do a UDP joke, but then I was like, maybe no one will actually get it. <laughs> so finally I moved on, and I was like, okay, PGP. And then I was like, no. Those are really, really individual bases. So I was like, maybe I just won't tell a joke at all, and we'll just move on. But anyways, all right. So of course, one of the first things we really, really saw we could do with uh, tuning the initial write was pipelining. I mean, that's a given. We were doing pipelining in some ports of our application already, um, but we decided, like, let's look and see where else we can do this and really optimize it. Um, yeah, so we also just kind of wanted to see what it looked like. Like, now that we're actually examining this packet perspective metric, like, let's see exactly um, how pipeline can be like well affected if you use pipeline versus not using it. So uh, I just set with a pretty basic test scenario when I started this. It was just a single Redis master um, with a Redis slave going. Um, I started doing just measuring packets for writes and replication um, with pre and post pipelining. And then um, it was pretty interesting because the improvement games that we saw came at both the initial write and then through the replication. So um, let's move on and look at that. Um, and then for anyone in here, just as a basis um, for pipelining, um, that's essentially when you're sending multiple commands into your Redis write um, at the same time. And then as opposed to waiting for the reply for each, you get all the replies at once, um, once that gets processed through. So first, another point too, <laughs> before we move on to the actual, uh, what the packets look like, if anyone's uh, into Wireshark, I'm a pretty big, uh, I really like doing geeky stuff with Wireshark. I don't know if anyone does remote Wireshark, but a lot of people normally just take PCAPs and process them in. Um, you can actually set up Wireshark um, to go and be able to collect stuff remotely from a server if you open a remote SSH tunnel. So if anyone wants to see how to do that later, um, I've made a GitHub repo with all kinds of commands and uh, ways to uh, set that up and do it. So if anyone wants to hang out and look at that, totally open later on. But anyways, cool. So write pre-pipelining. Um, so essentially this is the first one. So this was just me taking like, okay, let's see what happens when we put three set commands basically through how many packets would that generate. So um, just doing a normal set command, first one we're getting around a transaction of 11 packets total. And that up there, as you can see, is the actual uh, data from that single set command. So looked at that, three set commands going through normally, that's the 33 packets. So that's like without pipelining, pretty big there. Um, then again, on the back end, when it's actually doing that uh, write down to the slave, or writing it to the uh, replica, you're about six, because it's two packets per set on that. And it's pretty interesting too, you can trace those within Wireshark to see uh, how they're actually being affected. You can see the pings too and everything from the slave. Um, anyways. So then we can look at the right with pipelining. So um, with pipelining, we're seeing a significant difference. So that's the command again that I was using just for testing. And then the reduced packet overhead of all three set commands going was to uh, seven total packets. So I mean, that's almost a 3x decrease in what we were seeing for packet overhead there, which is pretty, pretty substantial. Um, very similarly, for the right during replication with pipelining, um, as you could probably imagine, all three of them are getting transferred in the same uh, replication action. So we're going from six packets down to two there. Um, and again, you can see them all within that individual packet. Cool, um, so that was, we. so anyways, after seeing that, of course, we went and optimized um, any places we could within the application to go into pipelining, which gave us a significant um, improvement there, but we were pretty into this project at this point, and it was kind of fun, so we started then again looking at uh, the replication side of thing, and that's where John came back in, yeah. as some good findings. 
cool. So we started with rights, um, but then we revisited the model. And if you take a look, the institute observers noticed that the, the master was always going to be the bottleneck. Because if you think about it, um, the master is handling all the rights from the nodes and is then replicating that out to all of the slaves, back to all the edges. So it's going to scale exponentially with cluster size, which is an interesting problem because it's as we add more nodes, additional compute resources, um, that actually makes the problem significantly worse. So our usual fan out wasn't going to work here. It was actually going to exasperate things. So we, we decided to, to get out the old TCP IP reference book and try and figure out how we could tackle this at each layer of the, the OSI model, each layer of the stack. Um, the first thing we thought of was, let's take a look at layer two and see what we could do uh, with Ethernet in particular. So talking about data link, it's not something we, we usually work with day to day or think about day to day, but um, just to revisit, this is um, Ethernet type two frame, Ethernet type two packet. <laughs> Um, it's broken down into destination MAC address, source MAC address, um, two bits to indicate the, uh, the ether type, or two bytes, I should say, uh, the data payload, which often is referred to as the MTU. We'll talk about that more in a minute. And then a CRC at the end. So this is typically what you're going to see on the wire with most deployments. Uh, what we thought would be interesting was investigating what would happen when we took the MTU, which is default of 1500. Um, and bump that up into the, quote, jumbo frame size, uh, which is 9,000 plus. Um, the thought here was the, the rest of the frame stays the same. The payload just gets significantly larger. And the hope was we could squeeze out significant TCP uh, efficiencies out of these much larger data payloads. There are some caveats uh, to this approach with jumbo frames. It's, uh, jumbo frames aren't supported everywhere. Uh, one, uh, you know, primary example is VirtualBox. The virtual networking on latest VirtualBox doesn't support jumbo frames. Um, if you're running a network with switches that don't support it, they're just going to drop the packets uh, outright. And it's kind of a, it's a daunting thing to troubleshoot. Similarly, routers have a gotcha. They must support jumbo frames both ingress and egress. So you need to pay attention to both ends. Um, and every component on the path needs to support them. Otherwise, you're either going to default back down to 1,500, or you're just going to see packet loss at various hops uh, in the path. And lastly, Jumbo, the definition of Jumbo, differs quite a bit when you move from vendor to vendor. So it's not standardized. It's not completely uniform. It's usually in the ballpark of 9,000 or slightly above, but it does vary a little bit. And sometimes those differences actually do make a difference. I should say a lot of this isn't as relevant today. Um, jumbo frames used to be uh, fairly non-standard back 10 years ago or more, but today pretty good support, but it's still definitely something to keep in mind if you're going down this route. Uh, in AWS, um, there are specific instance sizes that support it. Fortunately for us, C3 was among them, but just for reference, there are, there are a few others. The general purpose in classic, the M3, M4 support it too. Uh, but it is important to check to make sure your environment supports it. So with C3s, the default MTU size is uh, 9,001 bytes. So we were good to go here. So from there, we decided to, to move up the stack. And we wanted to take a look um, at tuning the transport layer to see if there was anything we could do with the TCP socket uh, to squeeze more efficiency out of each packet. So this is a, a standard TCP header, uh, source port, destination port, the sequence number, ACK, um, number of flags, the checksum, and your window size. You've, you've probably all seen this at some point, but just a quick refresher. The other thing that's important here, it's, it's not strictly a transport protocol, but taking a look at IPv4 header format, it's another 20 bytes. So we're talking about source IP, destination IP, uh, total length, some other headers indicating the version and so forth. Obviously, this is different with IPv6, but we were focused only on v4. Um, so those, those two uh, header segments together came out to 40 bytes uh, per packet. And what we started thinking about was uh, the classic TCP small packet problem. So uh, this, this was discussed, I think it was the early 80s, um, specifically uh, a user using Telnet. So as I type keys, um, you would send out one byte packets for each of those uh, keystrokes, each of those ASCII characters. 
So if you were to go on the wire and measure this, you're looking at 40 bytes of command uh, information for one byte of data payload, which is fairly inefficient. Um, and so this is a pretty classic problem uh, in, for TCP. The solution for this uh, is known as Nagel's algorithm. Nagel was a network engineer at, F at Ford at the time, I believe. Um, and this culminated in RFC 896. Um, and so what Nagel's algorithm does is it strives to, uh, it makes a number of trade-offs, but um, it combines uh, lots of small outgoing messages into larger uh, message payloads with the overall goal of reducing the number of packets on the wire and improving TCP IP efficiency. Obviously, this is computing, nothing's free. Uh, so there's a trade-off, and the trade-off is increased latency, which for certain applications, real-time applications, can become a serious problem. Um, and because of that, it's not something that's enabled by default. It's actually something that you can set on the TCP socket um, when you bind to it. And the parameter is uh, TCP no delay. So luckily, uh, Redis has the ability, uh, or bubbles up the option to toggle this flag on, an, or this uh, connection setting on and off. So the uh, configuration directive is the replication disable TCP no delay. It's, it's, it's a double negative, but um, this is what we were working with to tune. Um, so you know, the documentation indicates it outright. This will reduce the number of uh, packets on the wire with the trade-off of added latency. So for us, this was um, an acceptable compromise given the scenario that we were in, but obviously your workloads may vary, so this, I would be pretty thoughtful and take a lot of measurements about, um, or before turning this on. It's also interesting to note, we didn't see significant gains from this until we started working with very, very high traffic volumes and very uh, large data payloads. With smaller vol or lower volumes and smaller uh, payload sizes, we saw the increased latency, but not a tremendous amount of savings in terms of PPS. So it's, it's definitely an area that I would uh, pay attention to and tune quite a bit. So finally, on the replication side, we decided to revisit the application uh, layer as well and think hard about our topology. Uh, we, we got a fair, we got decent gains from uh, tuning thus far, but we needed to squeeze a little bit more efficiency out of the system. So what we decided to do was investigate uh, master-slave chains. So this is essentially creating uh, read slaves that would then replicate to a smaller cluster of read slaves um, and fan out from there. And what this does is it balances some of the write replication uh, duties out to these read slaves. Um, and in effect, shifts some of the PPS from the single master out to these read slaves uh, so that we could get underneath that 100,000 uh, ceiling. Uh, we, uh, based on the measurements, we could do this with the existing cluster and convert two of the slaves into these uh, read slaves. So there was no added cost, which was huge for us. Um, the trade-off, obviously, um, availability introduces additional points of failure that you need to pay very close attention to. So uh, you have to add you know, your additional monitoring and have a plan for uh, fail over there. It also adds additional latency because you're talking about uh, double replication. So again, it's, it's something that worked well for our use case, but certainly not one size fits all. So finally, let's take a look at uh, some of the results uh, from this whole exercise in uh, PPS. So to begin with, uh, again, here's the original numbers that we had, 180,000, like way, way over the measurement that we needed to be at. Um, following this though, so moving towards the uh, two read slave, or to the two like chain slave masters, um, and having six nodes then serving traffic for them, we were able to get the nodes per, well, the uh, master PPS down to 16,000 from the 180. Um, the read slave, as we said, it's going to increase because that's where a lot of the uh, replication is coming from. Um, it's got 48,000, which is still well within our acceptable range. And this, mind you, is again at the peak peak traffic that we would are assuming we'd see. And then the edge peak would be at 14,000. So there's plenty of room to grow within that environment now. Um, I mean, they can go by actually 2x what they're already doing, which is a huge amount. So um, yeah, it ended up being a pretty good exercise. Learned a lot there. Um, so finally, some takeaways. Um, there was no like one, when we first started doing this, we were hoping it was just something stupid we were doing, but there was really no one silver bullet. Um, it took a lot of different tuning techniques and trying different things to finally find something that worked for this environment. Um, 
again, latency versus PPS. I mean, lots of Redis workloads are very latency specific. Um, luckily, in our case, this didn't latency didn't actually increase enough that it really bothered this with in regards to us getting the PPS numbers that we needed, which were to this client like way more important um, in their specific environment. Like they were even okay with some of the replication being slightly delayed downstream from it. Um, and then finally, uh, tuning techniques, as we said, for things you can try, look at in this, um, right pipelining, that was a huge increase for us. Um, doing jumbo frames, that showed some interesting benefits. Um, again, might not everyone have the ability to do that in their environment. Um, TCP nagling, <laughs> uh, that was a pretty fun one. Uh, again, looking at latency versus PPS there, that's the biggest one for the, um, from a latency standpoint, in my opinion. And then um, the master-slave chaining and some of the different Redis topologies and architectures that you can utilize that will um, also help you reduce those gains across the board. And uh, yeah, do anyone have any questions? Anything they'd like to know? Um, no, we haven't tried this. We haven't tried any of this with async, yeah, any async communication or anything. I, yeah, not at all. No. Yeah, it might be an interesting avenue. Yeah, to that's actually a, yeah, an interesting yeah. approach to go down. Yeah, because then another thing we were looking at or considering was seeing um, what this would look like using like the new Redis cluster stuff as opposed to using the because this is all in Redis like two. Um, before like two six, yeah. No, so all we did was enable it on the clients, and then we just double checked to ensure that the instances had the virtual networking support for it. And I, I think in a lot of AMIs that support those instance sizes, it's actually on by default. But we went in our case, it wasn't. We had to go turn it back on. We were we're Ubuntu twelve oh four LTS, so I think it varies. Anything else before we finish up? All right, cool. Thanks a lot, guys. Cool. Let's not do anything else.